Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the Montgomery County Council. Today, we're holding a special meeting for the introduction, public hearing, and action on a resolution to adopt a second amendment, amended Board of Health regulation to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in the county. Before we begin, I feel like I have to comment on the MCPD body cam footage that was released earlier today involving MC Montgomery County police officers, MCPS administrative staff, and a five-year-old child and his parent in my district at East Silver Spring Elementary School. I'm sure many of you have already seen the footage or will see it in the coming days. I am completely horrified and disgusted by what I saw. The incident is absolutely unacceptable. No one, especially not a young child, should ever be treated this way by the people tasked with keeping our community safe. As the parent of two young sons, I, I can't imagine any of our staff uh, treating my children or the children of any of my constituents the way that child was treated. And I wanna extend my deepest apologies to the family. This footage should have been released to the council and the public months ago. Our community deserves to hear directly from the county executive and the police chief about what actions they plan to provide justice for this traumatized family and to make sure a situation like this never happens again. I'll recognize any of my colleagues if they have anything to say about this or we can get to the Board of Health regulation. Councilmember Navarro. Yes, I wanna say that um... I echo your comments, and as a mother, this is an absolutely horrifying uh, footage. Uh, I also want to deeply apologize to this family and really to all of our residents in Montgomery County. Uh, this is absolutely unacceptable. Uh, it is absolutely shocking. Um, I, I watched it and could not stop just, um, it, it's a mixture of just rage and just real sadness um, so I also uh, join in uh, your observations about the fact that this council should have received uh, this footage and should have been given ample time. Uh, and we have been requesting this. So this is also a real concern regarding the way that the administration handled this particular um, footage. And there is much to be um, now. There's much accountability that needs to take place. But I also wanted to join in. Um, and apologizing uh, and uh, expressing my absolute disgust um, as a mother and also as a um, resident of this county, this leaves a lot to be desired. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it was truly sickening. Council Member Glass. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I too uh, remain horrified at what I watched on that body camera footage of the MCPD picking up a five-year-old child outside of his elementary school and then beginning to scream at him and call him bad and said that he needs to be beaten. Deeply disturbing for everybody who sees it. And this is seared into my mind as anyone who watches this video witnesses a little boy, a little boy being met with anger and hostility by our law enforcement personnel, who then advocated that his mother engage in child abuse. It is shocking and terrifying on so many different levels, um, but ultimately we all need to come together to ensure that this never ever happens again, and that no child should suffer abuse at the hands of police and that no parent should ever have to witness such appalling actions. Thank you. And, and then later coach, coaching the parent on how to hit the kid without triggering a charge of child abuse is, I, I have no words. Uh, Council Member Glass, I'm sorry, Council Member uh, Reamer. It's, it's, it was terrible. It, just to say the words, they put a five-year-old child in handcuffs. It's, it, it, I can't even say those words without getting emotional and so many other things that happened in that footage that come through. But just just to think what it takes, what a mistake of judgment to put a five-year-old child in handcuffs. It's an absolute disgrace. I had no idea we had handcuffs that would work on a five-year-old. Um, Chair of the Public Safety Committee, Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I too wanna to be associated with what has been said by my colleagues. Uh, all of us have been horrified. Uh, obviously, I have not watched the entire video, 
Uh, we received it as, as everyone on this call knows. We received it a, a few moment, uh, a few moments before it was released. And, um, I was, I've been on several Zoom since, so I haven't had a, a chance to actually, uh, view it. I have heard from others what it is, what it is, uh, showing. And, and this is not only not acceptable behavior and on the part of, of any of, of, uh, of us, but it's certainly not uh, indicative of our police department in general. We have a, we have a police department that, that handles things, um, usually as far as, as we have known, uh, in a much better and, and, uh, in a, um, uh, fairer way. So to the points that have been made, um, that this should never happen again, I, I, we all agree with that to the points that have been made that we need to make certain that this never happens again. We all agree with that. And I believe that we all need to come together to once again remind everyone in Montgomery County that this will not be tolerated. Thank you. Council Vice President Albernaz. I have four kids, as you all know. One of them is turning five a little later this year. I have no words. Uh, it was almost impossible to entirely be able to process what we witnessed on that video. We need a total and completely transparent investigation into this matter from top to bottom, from bottom up. This is not us in any way, shape, or form. And to the family who has gone through this, I can't even imagine or process what pain you are all feeling right now. And as the chair of the Health and Human Services Committee, I also, in addition to this investigation, want to focus, as I'm sure all of my colleagues do as well, on the social and emotional aspects of this particular case. For those all, all of those directly involved and all of those indirectly involved as well. I do expect this body to be formally briefed in the immediate future on what transpired so that we can learn from this and so that obviously we make sure that this never happens again. I share the anger and frustration of all of my colleagues and I look forward to receiving that briefing so that we are able to move forward and learn from this horrific incident. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Juwanda. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I hope you can hear me. Yep. Um, Mr. President, you know, I, I echo and appreciate all my colleagues making those comments. Um, you know, this is one of those things where I don't know where to start. I couldn't, I couldn't even watch it. I couldn't finish it. I had to break it up into multiple sessions uh, just because it was unbearable. And I, and that's after having read the plaintiff's lawsuit and what was alleged and kind of knowing what I was getting myself into. Uh, I, when that came to light in January of this year, a year after the incident happened, which is a, which is in a complete, completely unacceptable to council vice president's point to the council president's point that we found out because a lawsuit was filed and we weren't notified by our police department, by our school system, or by anybody that this had happened. So when I found that out and my colleagues found that out, we requested from the police department and the school system to find out what happened. Three months passed with no response. And then we're sent something today. It's absolutely unacceptable. So let's, that's the process part. So we, I agree with, we need a full investigation and we need to know what happened and what the discipline was. And for, to our colleagues in Annapolis, because I, I can see this already coming, that there are investigatory, these are uh, personnel files and we're not going to be able to look at them. Well, then that law needs to change in Annapolis. And that's why we've taken positions on that. Now to this, this young child and to this family, I am so sorry. I echo my colleagues, the father of three young girls and a little two-year-old boy, even if you're not a parent, that shouldn't have happened to any human being by anyone who represents 
particularly Montgomery County, and who's charged with protecting and serving us. Uh, calling him a nasty little thing, beat, saying they're going to beat him, putting him in handcuffs in the back. It, 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 it's just unfathomable. And then the MCPS employees who stood there and watched it happen and didn't intervene. This is a failure of multiple systems and individuals. And there needs to be full accountability on, on all sides. And I'm just so sorry to this family. It's one of the reasons we embarked on this work to remove police from schools in an enforcement and disciplinary capacity. And that's what we need to continue to do. So I, I appreciate the, the chance to make a few comments, uh, Mr. President. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Friedson. Struggling to come up with the words to express how I feel and still processing what many of us have just seen. I share all of the comments that have been made by colleagues. I share the frustration with the process, but this is just an absolutely comprehensive failure, not just of policy and of laws, but of basic humanity. I mean, the idea of five-year-old boys being handcuffed, of uh, people in positions of uh, public power threatening, suggesting child abuse, it is so unacceptable, so unfathomable, so far beneath what we expect and what residents expect of those who are in positions to protect them. In the police department, in the school system, this is just a top to bottom failure. I'm appalled, I'm horrified, I am truly shaken uh, by this and I share the need for a comprehensive investigation. Uh, we're behind. Uh, the notification that has come to this council and to the public is woefully unacceptable and completely inadequate. And there is significant accountability to the public that is needed uh, moving forward. But most importantly, uh, I wanted to add my voice to the sincere Hi. apologies to the family that have been victimized. And we have a lot of work to do. There's just no doubt about that. Thank you. Council Member Rice. I can't add much more to what's already been said. Let me just, again, uh, to say ditto to everything that my colleagues have said. And, you know, this is something where, again, um, unfortunately, when these kinds of issues are highlighted, um, help us to get better as a system. Um, but it by no means is an excuse for the actions that were made. Um, but, but we have to be vigilant in the fact that we understand, uh, that, um, you know, there, there are going to be, unfortunately, uh, people who do the wrong things. And we've seen that on so many levels, as you heard. And because they did the wrong things, we have to correct them. Um, we have to give assistance where assistance is necessary in order to, prepare people for better interactions, but at the same time, um, if they're not appropriate um, for the particular positions that they're in, if they can't understand how it is that you deal with a child, uh, and that's not the same way you deal with an adult, and that's not the same way you deal with a person. <laughs> As you've heard, some of the words that were said were incredibly hurtful uh, to this young boy, and so when you think about that, we don't want that to be said to any of our constituents, regardless of how old they are. Um, these, these all are things that we have to fix with our system. But I want to be very clear that we can't fix them. Um, there is a way for us to move forward from this and learning and growing and being an even better system uh, for our constituency. And I promise to work along with my colleagues to make sure that we get there. It's clear that this was a complete failure. And we're going to have to do a lot of work if we're going to be responsive, supportive, uh, and, and um, really providing positive experiences for our community when it comes to our police and our school system. So thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Um, so let us now begin our uh, special meeting of the Board of Public Health. 
We'll begin with the introduction of the resolution. As we continue to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 in the county, we've been guided by our chief medical officers and our emergency management team whose guidance has been indispensable. On March 19th, the council updated the guidance for youth sports because we recognize the importance of sports and the benefits of these activities on the physical and emotional well-being of our youth, especially at a time when social interaction is so critical. Today, we're gonna build on this guidance in a way that gives our youth an opportunity to play sports and allows their family and friends to safely join as spectators. I believe the proposed amendment addresses the needs of our young athletes and our families while continuing to uphold the public safety measures we know keep us safe. We're reassessing our measures every two weeks. We'll continue taking a balanced approach in these decisions to ensure the safety of our young athletes and our students, coaches, and families. And I'll recognize um, at this point, uh, Council Senior Legislative Attorney Bob Drummer to introduce the resolution to the public and take any, explain the resolution to the public and take any questions. Mr. Drummer. Good afternoon. Uh, this resolution deals specifically with uh, organized sports and it makes uh, a change for spectators. Uh, last week, actually, uh, the council is, sitting as the Board of Health issued a, a regulation that permitted uh, organized sports leagues to resume uh, operation those that had not been previously, uh, those that were high risk sports. Uh, specifically, this regulation would, uh, would begin on or after April 2nd, that's next Friday, uh, would permit two spectators per participating athlete up to a maximum of 50 permitted if and there are some conditions, of course. The site has a barrier to delineate the area for spectators from the area for the participating athletes and coaches. The area for the spectators is large enough to provide for social distancing between all spectators from different households, and all spectators wear face coverings and practice social distancing of at least six feet. There's also a provision that if, uh, an organized sports event or a league uh, believes that they need more than 50 spectators at two per athlete. They can uh, ask for a waiver from the health officer or the health officer's designee, and that could be part of their COVID protocol plan uh, that provides for more than 50 spectators for an event if the officer finds that the plan provides for reasonable safety for all participants. Uh, the COVID protocol protocol plan is something that you required in the regulation last week. And that's what this regulation would do. Again, April 2nd, two spectators per athlete can be, way, can be expanded upon request and approval from the health officer or the health officer's designee. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> now we'll sit as the Board of Health. We need to begin the public hearing. Um, this is the resolution to adopt a second amended Board of Health regulation to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in the county. The lead sponsor is the County Council. Each individual will have two minutes to speak. Individuals will be alerted as they approach their two minutes and may be disconnected, and there may be technical glitches as usual. Ms. Kennedy, do we have speakers for this public hearing? Good afternoon. Yes, we do. Our first speaker for this public hearing is Matt Liber. Mr. Liber, you have two minutes. You may begin when you're ready. Council President Hucker, members of my uh, county council, thank you again for letting me speak. Uh, again, it's Matt Liber, uh, Executive Director of Mount Sacreplex. Um, again, before you to ask that you reconsider the mask mandate uh, in the county, as well as expanding the states that are allowed to play within the county. Um, as I've come to you before, I said there will be economic impacts uh, to these decisions. And we already seeing that happen. Uh, we have lost two events already. That one has moved to Delaware, one has moved to Howard County. Uh, the one moved to Howard County is a Montgomery-based organization that hosts that event. Um, we also have been put on notice that events over the summer are currently looking to move outside the county as well due to these regulations. Uh, this will have a grave economic impact on the county. Um, the first one over the summer, the lacrosse event, is upwards of 6,000 room nights. Um, so that is people staying in hotels, going to restaurants, shopping in our stores, um, 
this this economic effect will trickle down not just from our event but to other businesses in the county. Again, we need these regulations uh, changed now so these decisions can be made for these events to stay within our county. Uh, if we push this decision any longer, we will continue to lose events, which will have a massive economic impact to this county. Thank you for your time. Thanks for your testimony, Mr. Liver. Our next speaker is Angela Macio. Ms. Macio, you have two minutes and you may begin your testimony when you're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Angela Musio. I'm a Montgomery County resident and mother of three, ages 8, 10, and 12. I first want to lend my support for allowing spectators to return to the fields. There is no better place to practice social distancing than outdoors around a large open space, especially with all spectators masked and uh, many vaccinated. Secondly, I want to ask you to reevaluate your interpretation of the American Academy of Pediatrics guidance on players wearing masks while participating in outdoor sports while on the playing field. I read their guidance about outdoor sports, which says the following. Athletes should always wear a face mask between practice drills on the sidelines, arriving at or departing from the playing facility in a locker room while not on the playing field and during shared transportation to and from the event. The intent of the Academy's revised interim guidance, first dated in December of 2020 and then updated earlier this month, was to encourage the use of wearing masks during indoor sports, which were played, by the way, in many states and counties all winter long, but not permitted to take place here in this county, even though the AAP said it could be done with masks. Montgomery County is an outlier and is interpreting the AAP's guidance differently than every other jurisdiction in Maryland and the surrounding areas. I urge you to take a closer look at the guidelines and to amend your mask mandate to follow their recommendation. Per the CDC, the decision to wear a mask during rigorous exercise outdoors in the heat and the rain, for example, should be a decision made by the player, their parent, and the administrators of the, sp of the sport, not by a government entity. The virus does not see the Montgomery County border. Competitors will not come to this county for games because they must wear a mask, and this makes your constituents, moms like me, having to drive all over the state and neighboring states to play. This has a huge economic impact, but more importantly, forces us to lower our standards of safety as we patronize establishments that are not following as strict of COVID guidelines. Please act swiftly and make a common sense decision supported by the AAP regarding use wearing masks on a field outdoors. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Cynthia Simonson. Ms. Simonson, you may begin your testimony when you're ready. You also have two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, President Hucker and the council members. My name is Cynthia Simonson. I am the MCC PTA president representing our PTAs across the county. I recognize it's a heavy mantle you carry today making these decisions. I don't have to tell you it's not easy to be a parent in the time of COVID. Uh, we are supporting our children and helping them maintain any vestige of a the life they used to know and, and long to return to. I have four children, um, two that are already out of um, the school system, one that's a current high school athlete, the other who plays flag football for one of our organizations in, in the county. MCCPTA adopted a series of advocacy priorities this year. We included in our priorities that we advocate for a return to be evidence-based, specific, and transparent criteria. I asked the council to make decisions today that make sense with regard to spectators. 50 spectators makes complete sense to me when I think about the field where my son plays his flag football game. 50 spectators makes less sense when I think about the capacity of our Montgomery County High School stadiums. When I look at Churchill, capacity 3,000, Magruder 3,000, Gaithersburg 4,000, Einstein 4,000, the Hive at Damascus, 4,000 spectators, according to our um, information that we have online. So now, with only without being able to have spectators, and even thinking about 50, we are going to continue to have parents crowding around fences, close together, unsafe. I'd ask the council not to wait for a waiver to come from Montgomery County. We have asked if a waiver has been submitted. We cannot get clarity on that. Don't wait for a waiver. Look at these stadiums and make a decision that if a, if a game is being played in one of these stadiums, that we will adopt a certain percentage. Maybe, it, maybe it's not 25%, maybe it's 10%, but some number that makes sense. Um, if you need help getting uh, those stadiums marked, we have a, I am sure, a whole battalion of volunteers that will be glad to come and assist with that. I thank you for your time today. Thank you for letting us um, weigh in on this, and I look forward to your decision. Thank you very much. 
Mr. President, that's all the speakers we have for this public hearing. Thank you, Ms. Kennedy. Thank you to all our speakers. The public hearing is now closed. We can move on to the action. Is there a motion to enact the resolution? So moved. Councilmember Reamer moves. Is there a second? Second. Councilmember Albernaz second. Okay. Um, now we can have some discussion on the motion. Uh, Councilmember Reamer. Thank you. Uh, pleased that we're adopting this today. I just wanted to build on uh, the testimony from Ms. Simonson. Um, I, I have been in close dialogue, as I know many have, with MCPS, and uh, they indeed have been working with the county on the waivers. And uh, it's my understanding that basically everything is ready to go. Um, so we should hear shortly after the adoption of this uh, health order as to how MCPS will roll it out. But I think everyone understands that there are facilities that can hold more people, and that's what the intent of the waiver is for uh, safely. So, um, you know, we'll ultimately see. I haven't seen the waivers. I don't know that any council member would need to see waivers themselves, but uh, we will we'll be able to evaluate how that looks as soon as that is rolled out. Um, I want to just add, I think personally, this is, you know, an interim step, and we're at the very early stages here of spring sports. I think there are some issues that we'll need to evolve on in a couple of weeks. Um, you know, the, the 50 spectator cap uh, will mean for youth sports, you know, I know Little League season starting soon, for example, and a typical Little League roster is going to be 13 or 14 kids. So that's less than two family members that can spectate per child. Um, that's probably okay for the opening of the season, but I think we're going to need to address that as we move forward. Um, but uh, generally speaking, I think this should allow U Sports to roll forward. And uh, with the waivers in place for MCPS, I think uh, provided that our athletes continue to, uh, you know, follow protocols and best practices and not come down with cases, uh, you know, we should be able to have, have our games. So I'm pleased to support this. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Friedson. Yeah, thank you. I'm also pleased to support this. I do uh, hope and expect and know that conversations are ongoing about uh, addressing uh, the challenges with uh, MCPS, uh, as was uh, noted uh, by uh, uh, public testimony and Councilmember Reamer, and I uh, hope that we can just continue to look at that and, and make sure that it's uh, being addressed. I do think that outdoor masked, uh, you know, safe uh, spectating by parents in, in particular uh, is uh, a step in the right direction. Not all uh, activities are uh, equal in terms of their size. And so finding a way to allow that to take place in uh, you know, a safe way, I think, uh, allows us to, to balance that. And so hopefully that can be uh, move forward uh, quickly, that that can be communicated uh, to the public, because I know there's a lot of concern and, and questions out there. And so hopefully we can uh, get that done sooner rather than later. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, our, I think our emergency management director, Dr. Stoddard, is, can comment on the waiver issue. Dr. Stoddard. As our council president Hunter, uh, I just want to note that uh, we generally agree that there the sub certain spaces have more flexibility. I do think that one thing I would point out, though, in, in the part of the reason we talked about having um, the, uh, the limits with the waivers is that what we found in almost all gatherings is it's not just the total capacity of the venue; it's often the entrances and exits that present significant challenges. And so the intent with the waiver process is not to say that, you know, I think as we flew down there, three or three or 4,000 capacities to say that those facilities will be stuck at 50, but rather just to make sure that there are processes in place to ensure that distancing is, is followed throughout the venue, not just once everyone's into their seats. You know, y'all, you have to think about restrooms and other things like that. And so we want to make sure that not just the capacity of the actual seating space is, is capable of maintaining physical distancing, but the entrances, exits, restrooms, other associated uh, portions of the venue and also people that are sitting on. So overall, we agree that there, there can be a capacity beyond 50 for many of these venues. We just want to be working with those uh, 
uh, individuals like MCPS to make sure that each facility has the appropriate protocols in place to allow for that excess to, to take place. Uh, MCPS did submit their, uh, their proposal on Monday, and I did hear from Dr. Wilson this morning as a follow-up, and so we are working very closely with them, and we'll have something for them early next week to allow for them to meet the timeline of this April 2nd, April 2nd as proposed. And I won't presume, but uh, I think you all will be acting on that today. Thank you. I don't see any other requests to speak. Um, Madam Clerk, do you mind calling the roll? Mr. Glass? Yes. Mr. Glass votes yes. Mr. Jawando? Yes, I'm sorry. Couldn't get off mute. Yes. Mr. Jawando votes yes. Mr. Reamer? Yes. Mr. Reamer votes yes. Mr. Katz? Yes. Mr. Katz votes yes. Ms. Navarro? Yes. Ms. Navarro votes yes. Mr. Rice? Yes. Mr. Rice votes yes. Mr. Friedson? Yes. Mr. Friedson votes yes. Mr. Albernaz? Yes. Mr. Albernaz votes yes. Mr. Hucker? Yes. Mr. Hucker votes yes. So with that, thank you. The amended, uh, the amended resolution passes unanimously. Let me um, just mention before we adjourn that um, our previously passed resolution will update later today to further relax the restrictions on indoor dining. Um, as I mentioned last week, we have done the best we can in a changing environment. Um, but those of us on the Board of Health are not the only actors here. Our business owners and all the members of our community have a role to play to protect public health. As we've been reminded by our emergency management director many times, just because something's permitted, it doesn't mean it's safe. So. I would ask all of our restaurant owners to scrupulously adhere to the mask mandate and seating restrictions and the other guidelines we still have in place. And patrons should be remembering to replace their mask whenever they're not eating to avoid crowded spaces. We all have to do our part, not only to protect our families, but to keep our entire community safe. Cases have been on the rise since the governor relaxed restrictions statewide. We all need to do everything we can as individuals to reverse that trend. The government can't do everything. The last thing we want to do is to have to propose additional restrictions in the future. And with that, unless any of my colleagues have additional comments, I believe we're adjourned. Have a great weekend and stay safe. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Take care.